Hey, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Getting Started with Containers and Kubernetes. I'm Taylor Wagoner, the Operations Manager here at CNCF. I'll be moderating today's web webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today, Wayne Warren, who's a software engineer at DigitalOcean. Before we uh, get going, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, during the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Um, I'd like to remind you this is an official webinar of the CNCF, and as such, is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Um, and also a reminder that uh, we will be posting the recording and slides to the CNCF webinar page uh, later today. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Wayne to kick off today's presentation. Thanks, Taylor. Um, <clears throat> so uh, first off, thanks everyone for joining. Um, today, I'd like to present uh, an introduction to modern uh, distributed application design containers and Kubernetes. Uh, and throughout my presentation, I'll be threading in a demo of deploying, of building a Flask based uh, web app uh, that will deploy onto a DigitalOcean Kubernetes cluster. And yeah, so uh, as Taylor mentioned, my name is Wayne. Uh, I'm a software engineer. Um, I'm based out of Chicago and I, I work at DigitalOcean on the Kubernetes product. And again, our goals today are going to be uh, discussing uh, trends in application design and deployment. We'll get a, a high level overview of and motivation for uh, containers as a technology. And we'll learn about Kubernetes architecture and objects. Uh, much of this through a demo where we'll uh, build a container image for a demo Flask app. We'll deploy that Flask app to the, the Kubernetes cluster, and then we'll make it publicly available using uh, a load balancer. So when we talk about application modernization, we're talking about transitioning from a leg legacy monolith architecture towards more of a microservices architecture. Uh, and microservices are a core concept in cloud native apps and infrastructure. So, so we'll start by considering uh, what a monolithic application is. And uh, here on the slide, you can see we have a Flickr-like app that includes uh, user management, photo management, a database adapter, and a front end. And what makes this monolithic is that all of these components are intertwined in a single large code base, uh, which presents a number of challenges. Um, so all of the components must be deployed as the whole, and they must be scaled together, even if only one of the components, say photo management, is, is uh, over, overloaded for, its, uh, for the resources it has available to it. Um, and speaking of resources, each component may have distinctly different resource needs and deploying them together makes it impossible to optimize each one according to those needs in isolation from the others. And then uh, releasing a monolithic application can be tedious and error prone because if there's a bug in say the, the photo management component of the, the application, um, you have to roll back all of the, the components to a previous version as opposed to rolling back just the, the buggy component. Uh, and finally, we have lots of code handling different pieces of logic intertwined and dependent on one another, which makes uh, refactoring or swapping out chunks of functionality difficult and inconvenient. So what's the alternative? Well, the, the alternative is a microservices based architecture where we split up the app into microservices, uh, a collection of loosely coupled service apps that each handle a domain specific subset of the overall system functionality. So here in our presentation, you can see we have our uh, front end web UI, we have uh, our photo management 
component and we have our user management component. Each, each of these components is free to use the appropriate data store for the data type that it'll manage. So here we have a user management relational database management system and a, a photo management relational database management system with a spaces uh, with spaces for an object storage. So you can imagine storing the actual photos in uh, in the object storage system and metadata about users and photos in the relational database management systems. So one of the advantages here is that uh, each of these components can be uh, scaled in isolation from the others, allowing for more flexibility and efficient use of resources. And uh, yeah, so and one of the considerations that that you have to take uh, keep in mind when building a microservices based architecture is that within a given engineering organization, typically microservice teams would will have to agree on protocols or APIs for inter-service communication uh, as opposed to making direct calls to functions or libraries uh, within a, uh, a monolithic uh, architecture. So it, it does in introduce some complexity in that sense. Um, but yeah, so why is this relevant to containers and Kubernetes? Uh, the microservices architecture lends itself especially well to Kubernetes because Kubernetes has built-in abstractions that parallel this design pattern. For example, services to expose groups of identical containers as a single endpoint and deployments to manage groups of identical workloads to, in order to scale them quickly up or down. We'll learn more about these shortly. But first, now that we've discussed some advantages of the microservice architecture, let's introduce a method of packaging and running these smaller self-contained applications, containers. To understand the motivation of containers, it's helpful to know what came before. Early on, uh, in infrastructure consisted of a one-to-one -one relationship between an operating system and a hardware uh, computing platform, uh, which could lead to uh, resource inefficiencies in the sense that you have to figure out how to pack all of your applications onto a single uh, hardware host in a way that they all work together without interfering with each other in terms of dependencies or uh, shared resource usage like memory or uh, ports that they depend on uh, in order to provide their services. So uh, the next step in evolution from uh, hardware computing platforms were uh, virtual machines. So virtual machines introduced the ability to run multiple full operating systems on a single physical host from virtual images containing all the software necessary for the, the application in question. And then these multiple full operating systems are managed by a, a, a low level hypervisor operating system that allocates the actual, the physical system's resources to the virtual hosts. This allows for uh, more granular application sandboxing and ver versioning, and it increases efficiency compared to the use of physical hosts because it allows otherwise underutilized compute resources to be shared between virtualized applications. However, there are still some inefficiencies here because each virtual host comes with the overhead of its own full operating system. So the next step uh, away from virtual machines is our containers, um, which are essentially lightweight virtual machines that accomplish the goals of sandboxing apps and providing a consistent reproducible runtime with less infrastructure overhead. Some advantages of containers over virtual machines include they don't require their, full, uh, their own full operating system, but just a container runtime. Uh, they, the container image files are generally much smaller than virtual machine files. They generally start up much quicker than virtual machines. And there is an ecosystem of pre-built, pre-configured images available for use. For example, images that provide specific versions of Golang, Nginx, Python, Node.js, etc. But what are containers really? 
Well, we've discussed how containers are kind of like VM, but more lightweight and portable, but how are they implemented and what do they look like? At their core, containers are an abstract abstraction built on top of two Linux kernel features that allow you to isolate and contain processes, uh, namespaces and C groups. We won't go into these concepts in detail since this is a beginner oriented webinar, but they are worth reading up on if you're curious. The important thing to know is that they help accomplish the goals of sandboxing apps and providing a consistent reproducible runtime environment much more efficiently than uh, full on virtual machines. Now we'll take a look at some of the more practical terminology surrounding the containers ecosystem. So first off, a container is one or more sandbox processes running within their own root file system managed by a container runtime like Docker. Uh, and the container runtime allows you to run containers on a host operating system. And oftentimes, as in the case of Docker, the runtime also lets you build and uh, push or pull images to a registry. A container image is a set of file system layers and metadata with all of an application's dependencies, libraries, system utilities, et cetera. In the Docker ecosystem, we often define and create uh, images using a Docker file, uh, as we kind of show briefly here. We'll also take a, a more in-depth look at a Docker file in an upcoming slide. And then I also mentioned a container registry that the runtime will allow you to push images to and pull images from. Um, this is where the ecosystem of pre-existing Docker images comes in. Um, the, so the, the container registry is a, a packaging system that makes container images available for download by the runtime. So you can think of registries similar uh, as being similar to code repositories, except they're geared towards container images. So examples include Docker Hub, Quay.io, Google Container Registry, and DigitalOcean Container Registry. And then examples of container runtimes include Docker, as I've already mentioned, uh, Container D, and Cryo. All right, so uh, the next thing I want to do is uh, introduce you to how to build um, and run a, a container locally. So we're going to do that by uh, showing or by using a bare bones Flask app that will, that will eventually, but not right away, deploy onto Kubernetes. So the, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the Flask app. We're going to look at the Docker file that we use to build a Docker image from the app. And then uh, later on in the presentation, we'll, uh, we'll look at how to deploy the Docker image we build to Kubernetes. And for those of you who are curious, uh, Flask is uh, just a lightweight Python web application framework designed to make it easy to, to get up and started. So. Uh, the code you see here, um, we won't talk about in depth, but it's all we need to get a web server up and running on port 5000 that, that returns an HTTP body that just says, hello world. All right, so um, how do we get it running in Docker? Uh, in order to do that, we need a Docker file where we uh, define a series of steps that are involved in building the layers for the Docker uh, container image. And uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll start with the, the from step here. I'll just describe each of these steps and, and what they do. Um, so the, the from step says we're, our, our image isn't starting from an empty file system. system. It's starting from a pre-existing uh, uh, container image. So this is a Python specific container image specifically one that's built on the Alpine Linux distribution, and it's uh, specifically geared towards Python 3. So what we have here is an image name, uh, and then a colon, and then the image tag that specifies the, the version of that image that, that, we're, uh, that we'll end up pulling in order to uh, begin building our container image. <clears throat> so the, the next step is workdir, which just sets the working directory for all the future uh, steps in the Docker file. And then we have a copy 
which, uh, so let me just uh, switch over to my terminal here to show you um, where, I'm, where I'm working from. And that is uh, our, the uh, uh, Kate's intro meetup kit, which is used by uh, the DigitalOcean community folks to, uh, to demonstrate this presentation and, and the demo um, in meetup uh, situations. So yeah, so we have the app directory here, which contains uh, all the files that we'll be talking about while building this container. So we've got app.py, which we already looked at, Docker file, which we're looking at right now, and then uh, requirements.txt, which we don't need to look at. That's just part of the, um, part of building a Python application. So, so we'll be copying that requirements.txt from the, the working directory uh, context into the, uh, into the container image um, at this layer. And I, I just want to stop, pause here for a second and talk about layers. So when I say that uh, a Docker image can, consists of uh, a set of layers, um, what I mean is that every one of these steps that runs creates a new, uh, a new layer in that file system. And the advantage of using um, a layered approach to building file systems is that say you have uh, say you have like five different applications that you want to build containers for, and they all have a requirements.txt file, and they all have an app.py file. And the only difference might be, say, you're exposing a different uh, HTTP, or, or sorry, a different TCP port uh, for the application. Um, everything up to, uh, I guess, copying in the requirements file, if each application had a different um, requirements file would be able to reuse the previous layer. So all the layers that go into building the original Python app, uh, the layer that defines the workdir, and then um, any other common files shared between those uh, those applications would uh, uh, would be deduplicated through um, the way container images are described at the metadata level, which we won't go any further into the details than that, but it's, uh, suffice it to say, it's a way to uh, efficiently store um, lots of similar images in a given registry. All right, so moving on, we just, um, the last thing I had described was copying the requirements.txt into your container. Um, the next thing, that you can do is you can run arbitrary commands within the, the build context of that container. So here we're going to pip install, uh, which for, for those of you who aren't familiar with Python packaging, pip is just a Python packaging tool that lets you uh, reference a set of dependencies and install them in your local file system. And then we're going to copy our uh, all the rest of the files from the the current directory into uh, into the container image, and then we're going to expose port 5000, and then we're going to say that the default command that runs when we run this image, when we uh, run docker run here, will be python app.py in the workdir slash app. All right, so uh, now that I've described the docker file, the next thing I'm going to do is switch over to my terminal, and I'm going to uh, run docker build uh, and what this command does is it builds the image just described that I just described and this dash t flag um, specifies the the name of that we're going to give our image so that we can reference it later and then the dot at the end of the uh, the docker build command line is basically saying the context for the build is the current directory you can actually specify an arbitrary uh, directory here. Um, and that's the directory that you specify is what Docker will see when it's building your image. So without further ado, let's do that. And uh, I've got some extra arguments here to make this, uh, this work in on my machine. And I'm also going to say uh, no cache 
so that it doesn't use the build cache. So you can actually see it doing it actually running the build steps because I've previously built this image before. So yeah. Uh, again, we're pulling from Python 3-alpine, setting the work directory, copying the requirements at txt, and then we're running pip install. So you can see all of the, the packages that get installed in the image. And then we're copying the app.py into the, into the image, exposing port 5000, and setting the command that we want to run. So uh, let's look at the images we've got here. So I'm going to say docker image ls. And I'm only going to look at the uh, top um, 10 lines of output because I have a lot of images on my laptop. And here you can see we just created this <coughs> image 27 seconds ago. It's uh, 118 megabytes in size. And um, the, the tag name is Flask or the tag name is latest and the, the repository name is Flask. And then our image ID, which is a SHA-256 um, digest of the image manifest is shown here. And this is kind of a, to kind of like go off on a little bit of a tangent here. Um, this image ID and the tag plus the name are, are or this, sorry, I'll start over. Um, the image ID and the tag are alternate ways of specifying which version of an image that you want. So if I wanted to uh, docker run, uh, let's see. Oh. Uh, docker run uh, flask, let me refer back to the well, port forward. 5,000 on the local host into 5,000 in the container. And then we'll say the, we'll say latest here. So this is, this is one way to specify, uh, specify the image that you want to run. Um, another way to do it would be to replace this tag here with uh, the image ID. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, replace the the tag with uh, this image ID so that um, yeah, they're just alternate ways of re referencing the same image. Um, one thing to note about tags is that they are mutable, so you can uh, overwrite a given tag. So if we rebuilt, uh, sorry, rebuild. If we rebuild this image, we're going to end up with a different image ID. But uh, since we specified the flask tag here, we're going to get, we're going to overwrite the existing tag with this new image ID. <clears throat> yeah, so let's go ahead and um, show that our app is actually running in the container by uh, running at latest and then curling uh, localhost at port 5000 which may not be working. Um, we'll skip this because it's not that important. Um, the important thing is container clusters. So um, now that we've discussed containers, we've built our first container uh, and we've uh, kind of shown it working. Um, let's talk about uh, how we move from this sandboxed application running in a local de development machine to a production deployment running in the cloud. So yeah, we've introduced, we've introduced containers using Docker and a bare bones web app, but now say you're running multiple copies of this container and you want them to scale across multiple physical or virtual machines. How would you manage the life cycle of these containers, roll them out at, uh, or you know, roll them out as blue-green deploys or uh, perform other types of uh, distributed system management techniques. Uh, that's where container clusters come in. So examples of container clusters would be Mesos, Docker Swarm, or Kubernetes. This talk is going to be focusing on Kubernetes 
which consists of a set of uh, master nodes that manage the cluster scheduling, health checking, maintaining state, and worker nodes that actually run the containers and communicate with the masters. So uh, Kubernetes, uh, I'll just give a, a brief overview of its history. Um, it's often abbreviated as uh, K8s, and uh, the K8s is just kind of a, a play on the number of letters between the K and the S here. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, yeah. Uh, and Kubernetes is an, is an open source project that came out of uh, Google's internal cluster management system. And it's now one of the, the most popular, or it is now the most popular container uh, cluster management system. Um, most cloud platforms have some sort of managed Kubernetes offering. Uh, features are added pretty regularly, Bug, bugs are fixed. Uh, up to three major versions or three minor versions back. Um, and it is uh, uh, facilitated, it's uh, com the community is facilitated by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which also facilitates other projects such as Prometheus, FluentD, and others that I don't have listed here. So let's talk uh, a little bit about Kubernetes architecture. Um, since we've covered containers and we've made a, a case for the need to manage them, uh, let's, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, Kubernetes has a client server architecture. Um, I mentioned previously that the server uh, manages the cluster. We uh, often refer to it as the control plane. Um, and then we have clients, which are the, the nodes that, uh, that actually run the workloads that you deploy to your Kubernetes cluster. Um, and they are managed by the control plane. So here we'll uh, talk briefly about uh, the control plane. Um, it's broken down into API server, scheduler, controllers, etcd. Um, the API server is essentially the front end for Kubernetes. It's where all of the oper uh, API operations uh, land. Um, so it has a REST API over HTTP. It stores um, and it stores all of these API objects in the persistent storage backend etcd um, and communicates with nodes through uh, a component that sits on the nodes called kubelet. The scheduler is what decides where to run pods. It, it schedules them onto worker nodes based on resource availability and other constraints. Uh, the controllers are, uh, you can kind of think of them as loops that maintain a, a desired cluster state. So for example, if you have uh, block volumes or load balancers or you know virtual machines that, uh, that you need to manage, uh, the cloud, uh, there are cloud specific controller managers which perform all that um, management. And then you have the cube controller manager which manages Kubernetes resources like groups of pods, endpoints, deployments, etc. And then I, I mentioned earlier etcd, it's a, a basically a, a persistent data store for Kubernetes cluster data which it's a, it can be deployed in a highly available distributed manner um, to, be, uh, to be a reliable key value store. And it's also a CNCF project. Together, these form the control plane that manage the operations of a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and in a, a managed offering um, of Kubernetes, the Kubernetes API is often the only thing that's really exposed to the user. All the other components are typically hidden and can't be customized, modified, or interacted with other than through the Kubernetes API. So now let's take a look at worker nodes. Uh, the central component of a worker node is the kubelet, which is an agent process that manages containers running on the node. And it communicates with the control plane API server and receives pod specs uh, and performs all of the, the uh, interactions with the container runtime, um, which uh, like I mentioned earlier, it could be Docker, Cryo, or Containerd, or some other runtime. Um, 
yeah, uh, I won't talk about QProxy or C Advisor uh, too much. QProxy is basically a, a network pro proxy that runs on each node and it allows uh, inter node communication uh, between pods. And C Advisor is a container metrics uh, component, which um, basically reports metrics back up through the. Uh, <coughs> uh, Sorry, uh, back up through the, uh, the Kubernetes masters. But uh, so I, I mentioned that the API server is how users interact with Kubernetes clusters, but it's uh, um, actually more simple than just hitting a REST API directly, which you can do if you want. Um, we, there's actually a, a tool called kubectl, which is a, a command line tool that interacts with the control, the control plane via the API server and abstracts away the REST API uh, details that most users shouldn't care too much about. Um, and it provides uh, different functionality for mutating your cluster, like uh, creating different resources, uh, listing results, and filtering them. So uh, the next thing I want to do is, for, uh, for this presentation, I've pre-created a Kubernetes cluster uh, in uh, uh, using DigitalOcean. So uh, I'll go ahead and download the Kubernetes config for my cluster so that I'm ready to uh, create resources in subsequent steps. And it'll also be a, a, an example for me to show you some uh, kubectl commands. All right, so I'm going to, uh, so like I said, I already created my cluster. The next thing I'm gonna do is uh, get my kube config. Um, so that's basically dough cuddle Kubernetes cluster cube config save and then the name of the cluster. Um, and then, uh, so what that does is it adds the cluster credentials to a cube config file, my, my default cube config file, and then sets the default context for that cube config file to uh, that new cluster. And the reason it needs to do that is um, the kubeconfig data structure uh, actually allows you to have multiple clusters referenced. <clears throat> and it allows you to swap between multiple clusters uh, quickly and easily. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, uh, downloading the kubeconfig. Now we can type uh, kubectl cluster info uh, just to show that the cube config is active for the cluster that I uh, created before this presentation. So it tells me where the Kubernetes master can be reached, um, which is necessary for, uh, so, so when we were talking about the API server, that's what this address is referring to. Um, and it also talks about core DNS, which uh, we don't need to worry about for this presentation. Um, you can also run commands like kubectl uh, git uh, namespaces or kubectl git nodes or uh, git all dash and cube system. So um, basically I'm just showing you that um, kubectl provides a really user-friendly way to view your uh, the system resources being managed by your uh, Kubernetes cluster. So yeah, I talked about kubectl, different commands that you can run. Here's just a, a list of, of different commands. So you can explicitly create or delete resources. You can expose uh, services running in your cluster. Uh, but we'll, we'll move on. Um, so we've covered how Kubernetes is implemented and designed. And now let's talk about uh, how to uh, actually create Kubernetes objects. So uh, the first type of object we'll consider and that we'll create in our cluster is uh, a namespace. Um, and to set up the motivation for why you'd want to create a namespace, consider you have 100 people working against a single Kubernetes cluster and you want to limit their access and organize their workloads so that they're not stepping on each other's toes, you know, creating um, resources with the same names that overwrite each other. Um, a namespace is what allows you to provide this logical separation and access control. Uh, workloads get 
launched into the uh, default namespace unless you specify a namespace in a manifest or on the command line. So I already showed um, in, in the terminal here how to like list resources in a specific namespace. So uh, the way I did that was I ran kubectl n cube system. Uh, and then I just wrote get all. I could also write get a specific uh, type of resource. So just get the, get the pods in that namespace. Uh, yeah. So the next thing we'll do is we'll uh, create our namespace. So we're going to create a namespace for our Flask app. So we're going to call it Flask. Uh, cube total create create namespace Flask. So now we've created that Flask uh, namespace, and let's just show that it's empty. It doesn't have any resources in it yet. So we'll type uh, kubectl n flask get all. And uh, kubectl tells us that it didn't find any resources in the flask namespace. Yeah. Um, moving on. All right. So the first type of uh, resource that we're going to add to our namespace is a pod, which is uh, the fundamental unit of work or workload in a Kubernetes cluster. And it differs from a container in the sense that a pod can run multiple containers and uh, can also uh, attach to volumes or attach volumes to those containers. A pod kind of models a logical host um, it, uh, in the sense that it, allow, it provides everything you need to run an instance of an application. Uh, for example, if you have an app that serves files consisting of a container that does the serving and a container that fetches the files and does some processing, these two tightly coupled containers could run uh, as a single pod. They would share storage, they would talk over localhost, and they're guaranteed to run on the same physical node. Most pods, however, will consist of a single container. They tend to be ephemeral, and when they, when they die, new pods must be started. <clears throat> and finally, uh, just to reiterate, you don't explicitly run containers on Kubernetes, you run pods. And uh, to show you an, an example of that, uh, here is what's called a pod manifest. Uh, in Kubernetes, you define and create objects using manifest files, typically in YAML, but you can also use J JSON if you want. Um, and yeah, I'll just uh, quickly step through the different uh, fields here. We've got API version, kind, metadata, uh, and the metadata consists of kind of arbitrary key values, although some of the some of the those uh, key values are or sorry it's it's the labels that contain arbitrary key values that allow you to associate different parts of your uh, cluster uh, with a, a key key value approach um, but other metadata includes uh, the name of your uh, your pod and then uh, Finally, the, the last top level item we have here is a spec. And this is uh, a pod specification. Um, it allows you to define the containers and volumes that you uh, have related to your, uh, your, your pod. So here we have an image called DigitalOcean slash Flask dash Hello World colon latest. Um, so we're not actually going to use the, the container we built, the container image we built earlier. We're going to use one that has already been pushed up to uh, Docker Hub, uh, which is kind of implicit in the name here. Um, there's another part of an image name that you could add, which would be the host name of the container registry. But Docker, by default, just uh, it implicitly assumes that you're referring to hub.docker.com um, for your image registry. And then, uh, also at, at the bottom of the, the spec, you can see we're uh, exposing the container port 5000 within our cluster. So yeah, let's create a pod. Uh, last uh, dash pod. All right, so what we're running here is kubectl n flask. So we're running in the the, the namespace flask that we just created, and we're going to uh, apply the manifest um, pointed to by this dash f argument, which is uh, flask dash pod dot yaml. So 
let's just take a look at the contents of the uh, the Tate's directory that we're working in, which it'll contain flask dash pod. Then later we'll look at flask dash deployment and flask dash service. All right, so we've created our pod. Let's, uh, apologies for that. Um, I lost my team up session, flask app demo. Here we go. Uh, yeah, so let's take a look, get all in the flask namespace. So we can see that our pod is now running in the cluster. It's been up for 20 seconds, status running, zero restarts, one out of one container is ready within that pod. Uh, and in order to show that our app is actually running in the pod, let's uh, create a uh, port forward to that pod. Sorry, it's actually flask dash pod here. Unable to listen. It's probably unable to listen because I'm still running this app here. Now, retry that. And this time the curl should work. Yep, here we go. So um, we can see uh, handling connection for port 5000. Um, that's, that's a message coming from kubectl uh, indicating that it's handling that port forward connection. And then here uh, below our curl command shows that we actually did get a hello world body out of uh, when we hit uh, localhost at port 5000. So that, that proves that our Flask app is running in the cluster. Uh, we can move on. I think, nope, let's first delete that pod. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that you can, oops, uh, you can either create or delete uh, Kubernetes resources using kubectl. So here we're running kubectl-n flask and we're uh, using the delete command uh, and we're deleting a pod specifically and uh, the name of that pod is flask-pod. And we're, we're deleting it because we're gonna be creating a different type of resource shortly that, uh, that creates its own flask-pod instances. So uh, we're getting kind of short on time, so I'm going to skip over discussing labels. Uh, suffice it to say, labels allow you to um, associate different resource types, such as services, with um, other resource types, such as uh, deployments in pods. Now we're going to talk about uh, workloads. So we've we've covered the core Kubernetes unit pods. Um, now uh, the we don't always work with pods when we're creating like a full application because uh, we often want more abstraction on top of pods. So uh, deployments are probably the most common workload controller. Um, and as uh, previously, or as defined previously, sorry, <clears throat> uh, deployments are used for stateless applications and allow you to run several replicas of a given pod without having to create each of those pods uh, uh, manually. So uh, through a deployment, you can update the pod image, scale the number of replicas up and down. Um, and it's the only workload that we're gonna cover in this presentation. Uh, also worthy of mention are stateful sets, daemon sets, jobs, and cron jobs. Um, worth, uh, so, so the it's worth looking these up in the, upstream Kubernetes documentation if you're interested, but we're just, we're not going to cover them because we're running short on time right now. <clears throat> All right, so we previously covered pods um, and deployments allow us to run multiple copies of a given pod. And within a deployment, there's another uh, level of abstraction between deployment and pod called a replica set that kind of handles a lot of the details of, of managing the number of pods running at a given time, but you typically won't have to worry about replica sets. You're, you'll most likely be working with deployments directly. And as I mentioned earlier, deployments are used to run stateless apps uh, and they're stateless because when a pod gets uh, destroyed, it 
uh, doesn't ha it, none of the, the data that it's created locally within its file system gets preserved. Uh, and deployments allow you to control rollout rates, uh, which, is, which is like the rate at which the, the, the pods, the number of pods scale up and down. And they also allow you to roll back to a, a specific release, like with you know, a, a release of your container image. <clears throat> All right, so moving on to a deployment example. Um, similar to our uh, pod manifest, here we have a deployment manifest. Uh, some similarities, you can see API version, kind, metadata, uh, and then a spec top, le top level uh, directive. But uh, within that spec, is where the deployment begins to differ from a pod. So here we've introduced replicas, uh, a selector, um, and the selector will become, uh, so later when we're working with a, a load balancer service, we'll be using this selector here in order to tell the load balancer which deployment its uh, ports or its uh, traffic should be forwarded to. And then, uh, the, the final part of the deployment spec is the template. And this is specifically a pod template. Um, so it's gonna look very similar to the pod manifest itself, just sitting within a like deeper within the, the data structure hierarchy. So I won't, I won't talk about that again since I already talked about the, the pod manifest. I'll go straight to creating the deployment. So. I'll apply flask deployment.yaml. And then you see again, we have deployment.apps flask dash dip created. And let's take a look at uh, what resources that created within our namespace. So it created first off the deployment, and then it created a replica set that manages uh, two pods. So we've got this time we have two pods automatically created by our single deployment, which uh, kind of gives you uh, some beginning of uh, insight into like how a deployment is a more like a higher level abstraction over a pod. Um, yeah, so again, we can port forward here, and, but instead of uh, port forwarding to directly to the pod, we'll just port forward to the deployment itself. And then we'll curl to show it working, uh, similar to the pod. It, um, yeah, works fine. Uh, yeah, let's move on to uh, talk about, uh, so, so up to this point, we've talked about um, objects and components internal to the cluster, but we also wanna be able to expose uh, those workloads to the outside world and provide a stable endpoint for a set of running pods. Um, services uh, provide this um, external exposure. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of going to skip over uh, discussion of the different types of services uh, because the one we're most interested in is uh, Load Balancer because that's the one we're going to be creating. And what that's going to provide for us is it's going to give us an external IP that uh, traffic from outside of our cluster can hit, and then that external IP is going to get translated into uh, uh, addresses and ports internal to the cluster that ultimately get, uh, get distributed to instances of our application running on different nodes, to, you know, depending on the, the load balancing algorithm here, which we won't, we won't talk about those details either. Um, we'll just go ahead and create our service. And again, I'll just briefly talk about the service manifest and like point out how we have some similarities with a deployment and a pod in the sense we have API version, kind, metadata, and then a spec. And then the, uh, inside the spec is where the service again differs uh, from the pod and the deployment. We're going to say we're going to build a load balancer type uh, service where we're forwarding traffic uh, on our external IP at port 80 to uh, port 5000 on our uh, internal applications. And the, the internal applications are specified by the selector at the bottom of the manifest, which says app colon flash dash hello world. 
which that's that's what I pointed out to you in the deployment manifest earlier. So let's go ahead and start creating that uh, that service because it it takes a, a few minutes for the um, for the external IP address to get assigned and for the service to become available. So I want to get this going here and uh, we'll also we'll run kubectl-n flask git service and then we're passing a dash w flag so that uh, kubectl doesn't exit right away but instead continuously uh, shows updates to the the object um, as they they happen so uh, the thing we're waiting for here is for this uh, this external IP field to change from pending to a specific IP address and then uh, once that happens we'll uh, curl to that IP address at port 80 and observe uh, from outside the cluster uh, accessing the application we deployed inside the cluster. And for those of you following along at home, if you have a terminal open and uh, you're comfortable writing a curl command line, um, you can follow along and do the same thing. So here we go. Uh, you can take this uh, public IP address and run curl http colon slash slash and you can also access this uh, application running in the cluster that I've created for this presentation. Yeah, pretty cool. And let me see. So uh, I'm going to very briefly talk about other types of Kubernetes resources. I'm not going to put too much time on this because I want to save a couple minutes and maybe get one question in if uh, anybody has a question. So other types of resources includes uh, configuration maps, uh, secrets, uh, volumes, persistent volumes, persistent volume claims. Um, these, these things are ways that you can uh, persist or so the config maps and secrets are ways that you can pass configuration into your application without storing it in the application itself. Uh, volumes um, and persistent volumes are a way that you can share data between containers in a pod. And they get mounted just like a, you know, a normal block storage volume uh, on your um, file system, but inside the container file systems. Other features include uh, resource requests and limits, auto scaling, node affinity, taints and tolerations, dashboard, metric server. Uh, and then you also have third party applications uh, that provide some of the previously mentioned features, but also third party like open source applications, like, like Helm, which is a kind of uh, Kubernetes package manager for common applications such as Nginx, Apache, MySQL, Postgres, and other things I can't think of off the top of my head. All right, so if you wanted to learn more, uh, you could, uh, these slides will be, be available, um, will be made available after this presentation, and you can click through some of these links to, um, to learn more. So for example, the DigitalOcean Kubernetes community tutorials, the Kubernetes white paper, which kind of goes more in depth into uh, Kubernetes architecture. Um, there's uh, the history of Kubernetes and the community behind it, um, the Kubernetes Git pro GitHub project itself, and then the official documentation, which is spectacular. I can't recommend it high enough, highly enough. All right, does anybody have any questions? Yes, we have quite a few questions in the Q&A box. Um, Makes me sorry I didn't stop earlier. <laughs> yeah, they um, range all the way back from 10, 15 to just now. So I don't know if you want to go far back. I can ask you a couple quick questions. Um, or if you pop open the Q&A, you can take a look as well. I've got, sure I've got we the Q&A &A open here. So Great. why don't I just like skim through it for a few seconds here and think yeah. of what I could answer in a minute or two. Let's see, uh, so somebody asked, running the container runtime without a hypervisor is possible, but how many users actually deploy that on bare metal compared to VMs? Um, that's 
uh, not very common in my experience. Uh, typically, you have uh, virtual machines running the, the container runtime as kind of like another, you know, another layer of abstraction within your the cloud provider that allows the cloud provider to uh, provide um, efficient or to make the most efficient use of their hardware resources while still, you know, allowing you to create a cluster uh, that's separate from other users' clusters. Uh, but there are some, some use cases like on-prem where people will uh, deploy a, a container runtime on you know a bare metal operating system. Let's see. Let's see. Somebody asked, would uh, wouldn't the uh, wouldn't the build process overwrite files in previous layers? So uh, so the way the the layered file system works is that yes, if you if you create a file at a, at the exact same path as a file that was created in a, a previous uh, iteration of the, the layers, that that new layer will be authoritative. Like um, users of that layer will only see the the file that um, that it'll it'll essentially mask out uh, similarly named files in previous layers. So yes. Uh, somebody asked our commands such as from workdir copy run expose command. Are those case sensitive? And no, they're not. Um, uh, can you explain how the port mapping and Docker containers actually work? Like uh, when we search for HTTPS colon slash slash localhost colon uh, port number. I can't explain that, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it would take, uh, like I have like some inkling of how it works, but it would, it would be a big rabbit hole to try to explain it here. Um, should we use Docker Compose for the prod? Can we have pros and cons for it? So for those of you who don't know, Docker Compose is a command line tool written in Python, which uh, allows you to um, create a bunch of Docker containers uh, together at the same time, like within your local development environment. So say, say you're working on a, a, a stateless app that requires a, a MySQL service running and you want to run integration tests for your MySQL service, uh, Docker Compose, the Docker Compose use case for, for local development would be um, to you know, create a Docker Compose file that, that describes each of the Docker images that you want to build and run. And then you would uh, run a Docker Compose subcommand that runs it local, on your local system. And uh, uh, yes, and to answer the question, um, should we use Docker Compose for prod? I don't think so. I don't, I wouldn't, um, I would stick with Kubernetes uh, just because I'm, I'm biased towards Kubernetes since I, I work on the DigitalOcean Kubernetes product and I've, I've got a few years of experience with it now. Um, and Docker Compose doesn't actually interact with Kubernetes. It's a, a Docker specific tool. Um, a question around here, shell operating system, how can you delete a block of command at once? Um, for example, in your shell window, when you type in command docker run flask, how did you manage to delete flask in one go? Oh, those are, uh, that's <laughs> kind of a, an off topic question, but uh, there are different like control um, plus letter keys. So like if I want to just delete one word back in my shell, I would type control W and that would delete one word back. That should work for most shells. Um, and then uh, the way I like, I call up old command lines that I've already run is hitting control R. And there's like a whole category of like control codes that work in most shells um, that let you do things more quickly at the command line. Um, that was a fun question. Uh, what is a uh, bootstrapping of Kate's mean? Does it include creation of uh, Kubernetes master and worker nodes? Uh, yeah, bootstrapping a Kubernetes cluster is exactly that. Creating the Kubernetes master and um, creating worker nodes that then uh, attach to the master. And that's, um, that's the process that cloud providers like uh, uh, 
GCP, AWS, uh, DigitalOcean, Azure, that's that bootstrapping, bootstrapping process is uh, what cloud providers abstract away from you, the user, so that you don't have to worry about managing the cluster itself. You just have to worry about, uh, or, or you just get to worry about managing your applications running in the cluster. All right, somebody asked, what is a Kubernetes object? So when I talk about a Kubernetes object, let's, let's go back here for a second to our service. When I'm talking about a Kubernetes object, I'm talking about the data structure um, that you see here in this manifest file, um, which like I've, like I've mentioned before, consists of uh, all the metadata about your Kubernetes object that Kubernetes needs to know in order to um, continuously assert its state in, in the control, uh, the Kubernetes controller manager loops. Let's see. Uh, today we manage a lot of application specific configuration, which is unique to servers we deploy. If we're using Docker, how will this, how will we manage this application configuration? So if you have application uh, specific configuration that is unique to your servers, um, if, assuming you're running uh, virtual servers in a cloud somewhere, um, you probably have virtual machine images and you start with those virtual machine images, you create a new instance of your, of your server. And then uh, the way you might uh, deploy your configuration to that server, your de deploy that application and the configuration might be through uh, a configuration management tool such as uh, uh, brain fart, um, a puppet or chef or ansible. Um, and then, so you would run those, you would use uh, configuration described in those, uh, the, the, the languages of those tools to specify what applications and configuration need to be on your server. Um, with Docker, the, al like, the alternative using Docker is not to use those configuration management tools, but to build images that contain your applications and then have a cluster management system similar to uh, Kubernetes, like well, specifically Kubernetes in, uh, in this the context that we're talking about today. Um, that's where your configuration would lie. So if we, if we scroll back a little bit, or maybe it's forward here, um, let's talk about, so I, I talked about config maps and secrets earlier. So uh, a, con a configuration map is basically a, a, a Kubernetes Re, like resource object that allows you to store configuration files in the etcd database of the cluster and uh, provide those configuration maps mounted into your uh, your applications uh, pod containers at runtime and similarly secrets are uh, Secrets are similar to config maps, except they are typically encrypted. And when you view a secret on the command line, say using kubectl, uh, the the output would be uh, obscured so that you don't reveal uh, secret information accidentally. Wayne, I think we need to wrap up. Uh, okay. If you are almost done with this question, or yeah. Yep. Yep. I was just gonna. Uh, reiterate what the question was because I kind of went off on a big tangent. Sure. And uh, so, so like I was answering the question, um, man, like, like what's the alternative using Docker containers and cluster management systems um, uh, as opposed to uh, a traditional uh, either virtual or hardware server where you use some kind of configuration management tool to push application and configuration uh, code to your to your server. Yep. Awesome. Well, uh, like Wayne said earlier, we have uh, links to the DigitalOcean community page that we'll make available in the slides that you can get from the webinar page later today. Um, let's see. Um, that's all the time we have, obviously. And uh, we'd like to thank Wayne for such a great presentation today. And thanks, everybody, for joining.
Um, we'll have those slides and recording up later today for your viewing pleasure. And we will uh, see you guys again at the future CNCF webinar. Thanks, everybody, so much. Thanks, Taylor. And thanks, everyone, for uh, listening to me talk. Yes, great presentation. Great questions, everybody. Thanks so much.